Velocity and value. Those are two V's that we constantly talk about here on Jake and Jeweler Magic. And I've got an EDH deck that absolutely displays both of those. Siona Aura's Enchantress in EDH. The video starts right now. Special thanks to our Patreon supporters who power our channel. Check out our Patreon for monthly giveaways, exclusive content, and even a starring role in our fanfight series. Link in the description below. Hello and welcome to the day. Thank you for spending your time with us. Welcome back to another episode of Jake and Joel or Magic. I am Joel. Today we are talking about Siona in EDH. Siona, Cap Siona Captain of the Peleus, new legendary from Theros Beyond Death. But first, if you wouldn't mind, before we get started, if you like the video by the end of it, hit that subscribe button. It really, really helps us out. Let's jump over into the the deck stay tuned for the gameplay right after that we play an epic game with this deck and you've got to see it so this is the deck itself the first column that you see here is the auras we run all the best auras lots of lots of cards like the umbras that keep us from having to have a loss of a creature because it replaces the death effect cards like flicker form that make us dodge removal and dodge board wipes flickering ward that gets us through creatures and protects us from certain colors for removal spells cards like that that's really what we're going for and then you know of course like a giant all that glitters to make them enormous when they're switching when they're when they're pushing through more auras you know sage's reverie uh drawing cards that's what this column is right here drawing cards we have tons of payoffs eidolon of blossoms verder enchantress satyr enchanter cards like this that whenever we cast or an enchantment enters a battlefield we get to draw a card i do like cards like enchantress's presence and uh verdurian verdurian enchantress because when you cast the card you automatically are getting the card draw regardless of if that card hits the battlefield or not Skull Clamp is huge in here because Siona makes 1-1 one, one tokens, so we can use those tokens to draw two cards. Obviously, Core Spirit Dancer, Shram, another one. You want to you wanna try and get at least one of these effects out onto the battlefield, and if you have any extras, you just want to keep them in your hand because you want to constantly, as much as possible, have this effect on the battlefield as you're casting these. You also, and you'll see in the gameplay how we achieve that, you want to you wanna kind of deploy your resources carefully in this deck so so that you can build this board state that's pretty unstoppable and very difficult to do anything with minus some massive board wipes of both enchant uh, enchantments and creatures we've got a removal stack here i put calyx in removal because a lot of times he comes into the battlefield and he can gain us cards but mostly if we're taking advantage of this column we've got cards in hand he mostly is going to act like a removal. Exile target creature enchantment you don't control until target enchantment you do control leaves the battlefield. So just minus three him, target your enchantment that has the least likely possibility of leaving, and then you get a removal spell off of it. Obviously, generous gift. Heroic intervention is actually the opposite of removal. It's prote protecting our stuff from being board wiped. Dark steel mutation. We do things like this a lot in this deck because we still want our triggers off of auras, enchantments, and the like. Off of our uh, off of our payoff cards because we want to uh, continue casting these but use them as removal. Utility stuff here: ores and equipments get flash, mill them down. Danith is a great creature to attach ores to, as is Archon. Um, you can attach these to Siona and make a very big, powerful, trampling Siona that's protected. But if you can do the same with Archon, you might not even have to use Siona, especially if you don't need to dig at the time. Bigger payoff things, Sun Titan bringing, bringing uh, auras back from the battlefield, Heavenly Blade Master, getting all of them attached to her, and then anytime an enchantment spell is created in a 4-4, that's pretty awesome. And over here we have our we have our ramp. We want to get be able to ramp up, play a payoff so that we can draw stuff, and then start putting auras on some creature and just protect, protect, protect. Here by Rois is going to make our stuff cost one less, that's why I put him in the ramp category. Uh, cast cost one less there. Destiny Spinner prevents our stuff from being uh, countered, which is awesome. And then the rest of it is pretty self-explanatory. Siona is awesome. When she comes into the battlefield, you can reveal an aura from the top seven and put it into your hand so she digs for you. And she creates one one so that you can go wide as you cast auras to any creature you control. Let's jump into some gameplay and you can see how the deck works. It's just absolutely a blast. Look at our opening hand and we have a Sram, Verder and Enchantress, a Season of Growth, a Reliquary Towel, 
a reliquary tower and a fertile ground so we've got some ramp we've got some payoff this is everything we want to you know we want out of this deck across the battlefields we've got una we've got the lovers and we've got krenko goblins facing us down so we've got some kind of group hug going on in the middle we've got una maybe some kind of group mill going on going on over on the left we've got krenko over on the right We've got 1-1 one, one tokens, so Goblins is not going to overpower us too, too quickly. However, it can get out of hand if left unchecked. So we might want to, you know, if we get a board wipe or if we can maybe induce one from the other players, that's what we should do. Um, Wild Growth is a great, you know, top deck on your first turn. So we go ahead and play that and we pass. You know, we're, we're going to want to ramp as quickly as we can. We don't have any uh, white mana currently. Um, luckily we've got fertile ground, so that's fine. We can just go right into fertile ground and, and right into something like SRAM if we wanted to, honestly. We, um, like I said, when we were talking through the deck list, you really want to get one of your payoffs like Verdurin Enchantress or SRAM onto the battlefield and then start casting stuff beyond that. I wouldn't want SRAM and the Enchantress on the battlefield at the same time, unless we were just like really starved for options and you know it, we were just desperate a little bit honestly is the word i'm looking for there we can go ahead and play enchantress so that we can get some extra value off of the fertile ground in the season of growth um these early early turns we can go ahead and establish a good ground game without having to worry too much about uh zero two getting removed you know just like that before we can get at least one trigger off of her and get a little bit of value there most scared of the goblin deck doing that but they pass to us and it really doesn't matter um we can cast fertile ground with just the one for forest with wild growth on it and we get to draw off of the enchantress and we're off to the races look at that we've got another enchantress thing now now we need to start drawing auras and something to cast them on or we can just cast siona and hope for auras then here we can go season of growth so that anytime we do draw a creature to play or play a creature we are drawing more cards um i don't mind i this is kind of contradicting what i said about let's only have one enchantress effect on the field at a time so that we can save our resources this is across two different things so most likely one board wipe is not going to take out the enchantress and the season of growth it would take two or some kind of planner cleansing effect and so right there we're comfortable doubling down on that especially since season of growth is going to let us scry and that becomes huge later on you'll see you know we'll get to be scrying just before we draw cards which is just incredible it's awesome to see um player on the top left so far let's review board states we've got they're tapped down so they're yielding all that's an mtgo trick if you're not familiar you can just select if you have no play to yield all and so a lot of times in early turns of edh you'll see players just tapping all their mana just so that the game can go quicker and we can get through the first five or six turns and if you don't do that, you should, unless you have something to play, in which case, go ahead. Um, here, they play, our middle opponent then plays their commander, and we have the option to put a land onto the battlefield, but we're already ramped up pretty hard, and we need to draw cards like Gift of Immortality. Gift of Immortality is so good. I love this. It's one of my favorite auras in the entire deck. Essentially, it makes a creature have to be removed twice, which is huge. So in the middle, we have our uh, opponent's commander on the battlefield. We've got Krenko has now been played in the top right. Our middle opponent, you just saw, did the trick I was talking about. Went ahead and just tapped their mana so they had no possible play. Oh, buddy. Then we top deck Archon of Sun's Grace. And if I've got a favorite target as a commander for auras in this deck with Siona, my second favorite target is Archon of Sun's Grace. And we don't even have to cast Siona yet and use any, use any um, casts of our commander, per se. We can cast Archon of Sun's Grace, and if we untap with this next turn, it is off to the races. Gift of Immortality. That means when we play Gift of Immortality on Archon of Sun's Grace, we're going to create a... We should probably just go ahead and keep Shielded by Faith. Um, with Archon of Sun's Grace, we target it with the Gift of Immortality, create a 2-2 Flyer. If anybody board wipes or kills the Archon, it goes to the graveyard and then comes back immediately. 
At the end of that turn, when it got removed, Gift of Immortality comes back to the battlefield, targeting the Archon of Sun's Grace, creating another 2-2 flyer. You can see how this can be very problematic for our opponents. Top left gets a little combo run in here. They go Demir Guild, uh, Guild Mage and activate its ability and then make us all go off the top of our library. Three cards. And so we are all going to lose some life via Dusk Mantle Guild Mage. Sorry, not Demir Guild Mage. We double check. Yep, Una. That's, me. that's a mill deck. So maybe we need to start going at them. We see that they don't have any flying blockers currently. We are just making sure we know exactly what the text on Dusk Mantle Guild Mage reads. Up in the middle, we've got Azusa, we've got the Commander Partners, we see a full pass? Six cards in hand? Huh, okay, Kaneos and Tiro, they're not, they're not doing anything, they just, they are going to let us all draw cards. Okay, that's fine too. We already, we already pitched the, uh, no, the Shielded by Faith got tossed in the graveyard, so we happen to get lucky and draw Hyena Umbra even better than the Gift of Immortality, or in, in conjunction with, it's just absolutely a house. Um, otherwise, they've, they've chosen to remain fully untapped. They've got seven cards in hand, our middle opponent does, and so they've got options. Um, our Goblin deck opponent over here on the right is doing what the Goblin deck does, and that is play Goblins. We will see them play a Be Beetleback Chief here. The Foundry Street Denizen just came into the battlefield, so it's not going to get the triggers this turn, or at least not be able to use them. So we're sitting pretty here. There's no flying blockers across the entire board state of all opponents currently. That's pretty excellent. If we can resolve the Gift of Immortality onto the Archon, that's going to be clutch. Now we know Goblins aren't going to stop us, and we know Mill's not going to stop us, and so Group Hug here in the middle is the really the only player we've got to worry about. They go ahead and, at the end of their turn, dump 100,000 Goblins onto the field, and, you know, dope, that's fine. We're going to untap, we're going to see Retether. Ooh, baby, that is our endgame plan. We go ahead and shove that one all the way to the left. That's returning each aura from your graveyard to the battlefield. That's for a finishing punch. So here, this is what I was talking about. With Enchantress on the battlefield and Season of Growth, we get to play Gift of Immortality. We're going to uh, be able to... Oh, no, this is going the opposite direction. However, we're going to... Um, when a creature enters the battlefield, we're going to be scrying. Now we're drawing two cards off of each aura we've got. We draw a removal, and we draw plus two, plus two for each other enchantment, which just makes that creature enormous. Gift of Immortality resolves, so now we are in the business. We've got a scry trigger here, and it's enchantment from your graveyard on top of your library. That seems relevant playing against a mill deck, at least until they exile our graveyard. So here we've got one, two, we've got one of each color here, and so we go ahead and just Ancestral Mask. We're looking for a big punch here. Um, that's going to move our Archon, which is lifelink, by the way, up a lot because it's going to trigger off of the uh, or it's also counting excuse me the wild growth and the fertile ground including itself the season of growth the gift of immortality um the only thing it's not counting are our tokens if but if those were enchantment tokens i think that would be absolutely broken we want some more land right here because we'd like to be able to play multiple things in a turn in the future after what is going to inevitably be a board wipe um, and right now, we're most worried about some big crazy thing or removal spells coming from the blue-black player. We're not really sure what Group Hug is doing yet or what their strategy is other than Group Hug. And Goblins, we've got so much lifelink going on right now that, you know, honestly, the Goblins are probably going to get caught in someone else's board wipe. And so we're just not terribly worried about them, even though we maybe should be. <laughs> So we get another Dusk Mantle Guild Mage trigger here, and so we're going to get some, uh, or activation here, so we're going to get some mill, no doubt. Um, they also still have no flying blockers. I mean, our Archons and our Pegasi are just absolutely, absolutely home free. There's the board wipe. So Damnation is going to catch our Archon. However, we're about to see our Gift of Immortality triggers happening. Like I said, the goblins get caught up in someone else's board wipe that's obviously being played to thwart me. Fine. We're going to keep the forest. 
Um, everybody's gonna lose some life. We don't care too much again because of all the life link. If we can just keep this Archon alive, then then we're gonna gain enough life to offset whatever the hell they're doing to us. Gift of Immortality hits the Archon. That was another chance for our middle opponent to uh, eliminate the Archon there before the gift could come back, and they didn't. So at some point, you know, to me that indicates one, they don't have anything they could do to it, or two, they're just letting us do what we want to do. You know, we intentionally didn't swing into the person with a bunch of open mana. We, we judged our other two opponents threats and said, ah, I think bias set is worse. So we're just going to go after you. And that's kind of how we chose our attacks. Um, we do see a Locust God and flying one ones is going to kind of cause a problem for us. And so as far as a good target for Kenrith's transformation, this is perfect. We're going to be able to shut off the draw spell ability and we're going to be able to shut off the, uh, the creating 1-1 one -one flyers. You know, our future plan is to eventually win this game and so we've got to think about the value that they are, that our opponent is possibly going to get off of, off of the Locust God. So we go ahead and deploy another value engine, like I said, get SRAM online here. So now we can um, continue to draw cards off of all of our casts. We uh, do what we probably should have done before we put Ancestral Mask on it, and we cast Hyena Umbra. Um, make sure that your Umbras go on first. I think that's a note that I learned from playing this deck a couple of times is that the Umbras need to go on first. I also have an Uriel deck. That's one of my very first commander decks ever. So playing a deck like this, it was very near and dear to my heart. As you can see, we've got a lot going on and we still even ha haven't even had to deploy our commander. That's just like our ace in the hole. If we, if we absolutely get wiped out, if they use all of their resources to wipe our board, wipe out our hand, then we're gonna be in a great place. We go ahead and deploy the uh, Kenra's Transformation on the Locust God. Again, we just want to keep the skies clear as well as we can and seems pretty good paying two mana to ensure that at least from that value engine of 1-1 Flyer creators, that seems like a good trade-off and we'll go ahead and use a removal for that. We got a generous gift, so now any permanents that are giving us problems we can get rid of, but here it's time to attack. Archon is going to continue to go at Bioset. We uh, can spread the love a little bit. We really think about attacking Raven, but we've already removed his <laughs> Locust God this, this game. And we are still trying to at least, through the psychic energies, communicate to our central opponent, we want to be friends. We're not coming after you right now. Let me take out the mill guy. I'll handle him. If Goblins gets out of control, you handle that. And, you know, we'll duke this out at the end. So here, obviously, our mill opponent is a little pissed that we're coming in the air at them over and over and over. And so they have deployed their 5-5 flyer that also mills cards. Not a bad strategy. I think it's a good call at that point to go ahead and put some flying in the air, especially since their mill creates 1-1 flyers. Huge for them. However, we're still sitting strong. We've got Hyena Umbra on our Archon. We've got a SRAM that is that is drawing us cards. We've got seasons of, Season of Growth that's drawing us cards. The Archon's gonna have to be dealt with twice to be fully gone, okay? That's, uh, well, and actually three times because the first time the Umbra comes off, the second time it dies, it comes back and the Gift of Immortality comes on, comes back, and so you'd have to kill it that third time. So, there we just I, I i was talking about the archon's inevitable reoccurrence and we missed a big play they played a perplexing chimera our central opponent did so this is some kind of group hug steal your stuff you know don't mess with me politics deck i really like that now perplexing chimera we want to be careful because anything that anyone casts that spell can be stolen off the stack by our central opponent and then the Perplexing Chimera passes to them. Now what that means is that whoever gets the Perplexing Chimera gets that ability as well. So you can then swap that 3-3 for any spell that's currently on the stack, and that's huge. Not one that's resolving or something that's already resolved, so you don't get ETBs. It takes it right off the stack and makes it your spell. So we gotta be careful with that going forward, and we gotta see how they're going to use that. Obviously, 
We're still not going after them. We're trying to have this unspoken alliance and we can deal with that. At the same time, they've played Oath of Druids. Now, Oath of Druids is going to be giving everybody free creatures off the top of their library at the beginning of their turn. I've got more creatures than everybody right now, and so I would be the only one that wasn't able to use this. However, a little bit of a spoiler, but it's 30 seconds from now, I'm pretty sure. You can watch Cranko up there. The goblin player has been creating the goblins at the end of their turn and not at the end of like the central opponent's turn or somebody else's in a response to anything. They just create them. And so I'm going to be able to use all of the goblins as my target over there for Oath of the Druids or whatever it's called, and then I'm going to get that trigger as well. Um, Goblin War Driver was not stolen by our perplexing Chimera. There it is. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may swap. Um, Mud button torch runner, more goblins being crapped out on the battlefield. Our our goblins opponent is at three cards in hand after mud button torch runner was cast. So I'm assuming that the torch runner comes in, it deals three to any target, and it's dealing three to the Archon of Sun's Grace. No, no, it's not. We don't know where the damage is going yet. Or did it hit somebody in the face? Wasn't even paying attention. Oh, it's when it dies. Sorry, I can't, I don't even know. I don't know goblins. I've never played the goblins deck. Now we're gonna get Battle Ham and add a mana for each creature they control. So right now it's four, not a great Battle Ham, but it's something, I guess. And so as you can see, the goblins opponent is kind of starting to burn out already here on turn seven. Um, you know, we're not that worried about it at this point. A board wipe and they're pretty much done. You know, and there it is. There's the Cranko that creates all of the goblins. And um, Raze Runners, you know, it doesn't even have plus one, plus one counters on it. So that's not doing anything right now. They create all the goblins there, which gives us a target for Oath of the Druids, which is going to give us a free creature onto the battlefield should we get lucky. There's the triggered ability of the Raze Runners. It went over there. And Oath of Druids. Okay, so at the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player chooses target player who controls more creatures than they do and is their opponent. So we're like, all right, well, make sticky sticks. Pretty sure five is greater than... Five equals how many we got, and they got more than that. So then we get uh, enchantment spells cost one less, free off the top. Okay, we get a season of growth trigger. We draw an enlightened tutor. Dope. At this point, we're like getting a little overwhelmed with options. We have the reliquary tower. Like I said, thank goodness, so that we just get to keep all this in our hand. Um, Eidolon of Countless Battles, this is huge now. Really what we want to do now is grow our Archon. We want to make that Archon as big as we possibly can and make it, uh, and give it Trample on as well. Um, you can see right there that we, we did a little mini punt. <laughs> Eidolon of Countless Battles was supposed to be cast as a bestow, but apparently when I clicked it out of my hand, I clicked it as cast and not cast as bestow. So instead of going on Archon of Sun's Grace, now we've just got a giant 13-13 body on the battlefield. You know, we'll take it. We would have preferred it on the first strike flying lifelinker, <laughs> no doubt, but especially one that's protected by Hyena Umbra and Gift of Immortality, no doubt. But, you know, it is what it is. So, we've got a lot of options here. We can Satess in here and just draw bigger creatures. Honestly, we want to Enlighten Tutor, but we don't want Perplexing Chimera to grab that Enlighten Tutor because they can get any artifact or enchantment from their library. Um, and we want to do that in the EOT anyway. So, we're just trying to bait out this, uh, this Chimera ability. You know, we've got the Dark Steel mutation on there, and you know, it's fine. We can just attack. We're gonna continue to attack. We can go there. We're flying all at all at our uh, mill opponent, and then we remember, oh, we've got a 5-5 five, five flyer over there. Is that really what we wanna do? No, I don't think that's what we wanna do. <laughs> so we'll just go at the Goblins player. Again, unspoken alliance with our middle opponent. 
we want to make sure that they know we're not really interested in screwing with them so far they've only given us nice toys to play with and we're not trying to bite the hand that feeds i'd rather get mill and and uh, goblins out of the game and then we'll handle you what we really would have liked there is if our uh, Eidolon had been on the Archon as was originally planned, but the best laid plans go awry and sometimes Joel can't click the mouse correctly. What we can do now is with Eidolon and Satessin, we can start kind of doubling up on those. We don't need a growth enchantment on Eidolon. We do need a growth enchantment on Satessin, but on Eidolon we need some kind of avoidance enchantment. So we can start making those two creatures our ground game and just leave the Archons in the air to just keep chipping away with lifelink and really piss our opponents off and try and come at them from two fronts. So black and blue mill stays open that turn. That makes us a little nervous. You know, what kind of instant speed removal have they got? What kind of instant speed board wipe have they got? We're a little too deployed right now, but not much. If we had clicked correctly with the Eidolon, I would feel much more comfortable because the Hyena Umbra would protect that Eidolon. But you see, at that point we needed for Satessin to be played to potentially bait the Chimera so that we can get, we really want to get our Enlightened Tutor off at the end of McSticky Stick's turn and get, you know, that light killer, killer enchantment that's going to win us the game. So we see the, the dinosaur here and they're going to free their Lotus from Kenrith's transformation. Um, locust, excuse me. They're going to free their Locust. They'll create a 1-1 one, one flyer, that's fine. Atali, we've got bigger problems now. We really don't want Atali to uh, to untap so that they can swing. So now middle opponent's starting to be a threat. However, hopefully they've seen that we haven't attacked them, they haven't attacked us. We don't have any attacks. I think everybody's trying to stay untapped so that they can block a potential death assault from me. Um, this deck does have the potential with the right enchantment to all of a sudden create, you know, like a 2020 out of nowhere that can't be killed and can't be blocked, and suddenly they're out of the game. Um, War Cadence is going to be interesting here because it's going to make it's so that creatures can't block unless they pay X, which is whatever red pumps into it. But it's not a spell that's going to hurt us this turn. Um, maybe on the next untap for sure. Uh, then they play Seer Sundial and Chimera goes onto the stack and Chimera says, you know what? I'll take that Seer Sundial because I don't want any more cards going into your hand. So now our goblin opponent is completely out of cards. They do have Krenko on the battlefield, so they can make a bajillion goblins whenever they want to. And next turn when they untap, War Cadence is going to uh, make it very difficult to deal with that army of 1-1s. One so we have to we have to get goblins. Go ahead and, you know, finish that one off. They are out of resources. We know that they're not going to respond to any kind of potential lethal swings. We've got them in the air. Their entire game is ground game. Um, there you go. There's 10 more goblins. But also that keeps it so that we definitely are getting value off of um, Oath of Druids. I think that's another reason why my board looks over deployed right now and makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, we ended up not going with Enlightened Tutor there because of Oath of Druids. Don't want to deal with that. Um, because we wouldn't have de necessarily cast that Centaur off of Oath of Druids unless it was a free cast. You know, we'll take it. So we get a free Danatha here, which makes our auras cost one less. And it's always good to remember, I mean, we're drawing cards with this deck. That's what we're doing. So really all we got to do is cast Enlightened Tutor here, put something on top of our library. Hope that blue black over there doesn't have instant speed and mill to disrupt us and we can go and get you know whatever aura cast an enchantment and then draw that card um, our goblins opponent says all right you can go get whatever you want because i can take whatever you get and don't have to worry about um don't have to worry about the enlightened tutor and i can still steal whatever you get 
we've got some options here. Um, now we can uh, cast an enchantment and draw it. Um, like I said, we want to give avoidance to our Eidolon. So we're going with uh, Trample on the Eidolon. Also gives it lifelink, which is dope. Now most of our big creatures are are completely uh, completely lifelinking us up. Our middle opponent then quits, which is a little mm -hmm. strange because Perplexing Chimera there could have stolen that Unflinching Courage. Um, we still would have gotten our draw triggers, which is really what we wanted, but I think our middle opponent had just had enough at that point, and we're overrunning the board pretty solidly. Um, a board wipe does reset us a bit, but Archon is going to allow us to just grow, grow, grow right back into it. Uh, so Tessin's going to draw us a card. Archon's going to get a Pegasus into the air. We draw another Snake Umbra, or we draw the Snake Umbra we put there so that we can just make our stuff avoid board wipes, which is really all we're scared of at this point. And now it's off to the races. Nothing's going to possibly steal our stuff. We've got one opponent at 23, one opponent at 25, and out of cards, and we're at 60. We've got a nigh indestructible Archon in the air. We've got an 18, 18 lifelinking trample on the ground. Um, you know, we're not going to swing that on the ground at the goblins because they could actually block and kill it if they wanted to, which would be crazy, but they could. Um, we're going to attack in the air at the goblins and we're going to attack on the ground against our middle opponent. You know, we've got 18 damage going at 6 blocking power, potentially a 23 life total. And then we've got, what, 4, 2, 4, 6, 10 in the air. All lifelink. All of it lifelink. So nobody chooses to block. We go to 88. 88. Our opponents are at 5 and 15, respectively. Um, here's one. Probably should have cast it beforehand, but, you know, we're just going to double down now that there was no instant speed removal. We don't want a board wipe to happen and get us off of this, and if we can just kind of really press hard on Archon and Eidolon surviving until our next untap, we probably win the game. Um... At this point, we don't really need to draw any more cards. We would actually prefer removal of some sort. Uh, we are sitting on a generous gift, a Swords of Plowshares, and a Beast Within. So we're very comfortable. We're very confident at this point that not much can be done to super screw with us. Our two best and biggest creatures survive a board wipe. Um, we've got three removals for anything that prevent us from getting there. Um, and again, you know, even if, if goblins can do something screwy with War Cadence, we can still just Generous Gift or Beast within that enchantment and ensure that that ain't happening. Um, Frank's Sanity, uh, you know, it feels kind of like they're starting to get a little combo-y over here. Um, Enchanted Player puts a top X into their graveyard according to, I think, how many they've put in there this turn. And so when we see... Uh, any kind of mill anything we're just going to go ahead and just to be safe no combos here frank sanity can screw off you can have a beast we don't care and um that's pretty much it for them i think that our mill opponent there was going for some kind of weird combo and we thwarted that so now it's us at 89 versus a goblins deck that is out of cards and at 15 with no blocking power in the air Goblin Sledder is going to come on. Target creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for a sacrifice. So only one of these goblins has to get through and a ton of damage happens. That's pretty cool. Um, but again, we just, we really don't care. We're at 89. We're going to see what this, we can't, I don't think block any of this. I think we played that a little bit loose when we could have generous gifted the cadence and at least made sure that we had a chance. But 15 there plus two, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, it's it's not, it's just not enough. 23, even with, we know they have nothing in hand, so nothing's gonna grow it crazy. They've got a sacrifice attacking power to just equal one more attacking power, so Goblin Sledder really doesn't matter. You know, we'll take, we'll take it. It's fine. Um, 
20 something doesn't really bother us, especially when our crackback is going to be for the game. In the air right now, we've got four, we've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 in Pegasus plus four in our Pegasus captain. So it's like, sure, we'll swords that one. So it's, you, there's just no screwy anything. We can still do this in the air. We can still do this on the ground. One big attack is all this is going to take. Um, they do have 20 goblins on the ground now. So that's interesting. But here's where we just go ahead and we've got some GG's over there, obviously. Um, I say GG because I think our goblin opponent said it. And um, we are going to here go for the throat because we think that this is it. So our big final punch is a retether. We're going to get to return each aura from the graveyard of the battlefield and enchant wherever we want to. Um, the biggest one there is Ancestral Mask. Uh, Flickering Ward is, is pretty dope because it's going to make our Eidolon uh, pro red. So it can't even be blocked, and so that's the game right there. But we still have to assign all the rest of these out. That makes our flying first striker, what is that, 23-23. We're drawing a ton of cards off Sates and Champion. Archon's making a ton of Pegasus. Absolutely ridiculous. This is, we had the game, we flexed, and we won. As you can see, we got a little lucky in that game with some well-timed and well-avoided removal and board wipes. However, once we had that board state going, we didn't want to over-apply or over-produce in any one little area. We just kind of wanted to keep it building but keep this like indestructible foundation underneath it so that we never have to deal with it. Appreciate everybody watching. Let me know which cards you have been playing in Sion and let me know if you've been playing any of the new legendaries from Theros Beyond Death. I've had an absolute blast playing some of them in EDH. We appreciate your time. If you wouldn't mind hitting subscribe, it really helps us out. If you want to support us further, we've got a Patreon. The link is down in the description below. And depending on when you're watching this, we've still got like two t-shirts that we're giving away, logo t-shirts, to anyone who subscribes to our Patreon. And if you want to hang out with us, we're streaming most Tuesday and Thursday evenings over on Twitch. I appreciate you watching. We'll catch you later.